The smell of evasiveness will linger. Mormon, Mormonism has set up a protective layer of plausible deniability around its leaders and tradition and belief system. Leaders have essentially been given a free pass to say whatever the heck they want to say, foster whatever they want to foster, and tolerate whatever they want to tolerate. Two weeks ago, I'll give you a good example of the absurdity of this if you take it to its logical conclusions. Two weeks ago, outside General Conference, I asked an up-and-coming Mormon apologist named Stephen Schmoot, Schmoot uh, about a hypothetical scenario. What if Thomas Monson got up in General Conference behind the pulpit and said that Jesus was once a sinner? And I ask that because Mormons consistently say Jesus never sinned. What if 90% of the lay membership, because of Monson's influence, then believed it? What if there was near unanimity among the leadership on this? What if the church taught that Jesus sinned via correlated institutional channels of influence, the manuals, the magazines, the booklets, and the videos? Would you then consider Monson's statement to be blasphemy? And then consider it to be the kind of fruit that would disqualify someone for being a true prophet? And he answered, no, because it didn't yet fit the condition of what constitutes official doctrine. And it wasn't yet blasphemy. Officiality for him was more of a determining factor than content. I have written about this elsewhere, so I'll be brief. Whereas Mormon leaders have taught, the Lord will never allow the president of the church to be The Lord will never allow the president of the church to lead us astray. That seems to have been reduced to the Lord will never allow the president of the church to officially lead us astray. <laughs> Jesus says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. He did not follow this with, you will recognize them by their fruits, but only when they are officially canonized as publicly binding doctrines of the LDS Church. No, he has simply said you will recognize them by their fruits. The content of the fruit matters more than the officiality of the fruit. A rotten black banana is still rotten with or without the dull sticker. Got it? Biblically, we have a responsibility to inspect the fruits of the LDS Church, what they teach and foster and tolerate as acceptable teaching and belief among the members matters. They are shepherds over sheep. The honor of the church ought not be defended at the expense of the honor of the glory and beauty of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Sin is not worthy of worship, amen? But there is absolutely nothing about our God's past that isn't worthy of uttermost worship. There is nothing about our God's past to be ashamed of. You don't have to block out of your mind what God was 5.6 billion years ago. Ooh, God, you're great, but 5.6 billion years ago, you were something else. No, oh, there's nothing you need to turn away from an embarrassment. If there were a library in heaven full of books describing everything God has ever done, you wouldn't need to ban or suppress or censor or filter or sanitize any of those books as non-faith-promoting literature. It'd all ultimately be faith-promoting. You don't need to limit your worship of God in a way that excludes parts of his past. There is nothing but beauty and glory and purity in our God's past. Nothing about God is ultimately embarrassing, and everything about him is worthy of worship, past, present, and future. Think about it. Everything about God, past, present, and, fu present and future, is worthy of your praise and adoration and awe. I'll say it again. I'll say it again. He's always been pure and holy and admirable. Don't limit your worship of who God, to, to who God is now. Let it so tell God, Lord, I want to worship you for the whole thing, for who you are, past, present, and future. Be confident about that. 
It is now that I would like to worship God in the giving of syllogisms. Mormons may not agree with the premises, but I pre present these to paint a portrait of God's beauty and glory. The rock of ages, you can trust him. The more consistent someone has been, the more reliable they are. Agreed? There is inconsistency between being a sinner and being sinless. Therefore, God never sinned. Because, therefore, a God who never sinned is more reliable than a God who did. Well, God is maximally reliable. Indeed, he's the most reliable of all beings. A God who never sinned is more reliable than a God who did. Therefore, God never sinned. Or as Habakkuk 1.12 says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. God is the Most High. It is better, more morally praiseworthy, to have never sinned than to have ever sinned. God is the best of all beings. Indeed, he is the best of all possible beings. Therefore, God never sinned. If God sinned, he had to submit to a forgiver higher than himself. But God is the Most High. Therefore, God never sinned. An all-knowing being does not sin. God has always been all-knowing. Therefore, God never sinned. It is unwise to sin, but God's always been all-wise. Therefore, God never sinned. When a person sins, he spiritually weakens himself, but God's always been all-powerful. Therefore, God never sinned. Sinners only continue to exist by grace, but God has been eternally self-existent. Therefore, God never sinned. No one can atone for his own sins. God is the only one who can atone for sins. Therefore, if God sinned, there would be none who could atone for his sins. Sinners not atoned for cannot become gods. If God sinned, then there was no one who could atone for his sins. Therefore, God never sinned. It's more glorious to have never sinned than to have ever sinned. The Son has never sinned. Therefore, the Son is more glorious than those who have sinned. The Father is eternally equal in glory with the Son. The Son is more glorious, like we said, than those who have sinned. Therefore, God the Father never sinned. To sin is not loving of the Son. The Father has always perfectly loved the Son. Therefore, God never sinned. The Son would only worship a person worthy of worship. Sinners are not worthy of worship. Therefore, the Son has never worshiped a sinner. The Son has eternally worshipped the Father, but like we said, the Son has never worshipped a sinner. Therefore, God never sinned. The Holy Spirit has always participated in life, in the life of the Father and the Son, but the Holy Spirit does not participate in sin. Therefore, God never sinned. This is my closing. I've talked to Mormon children, preteens, eight, nine year olds. It's kind of awkward situations at Manti, for example, where there's just groups of kids walking around, and able to talk to a group of really, really young kids, really young kids, real gentle with them. And they hear me maybe talking to an adult, and I'm like, God never sinned. And the kids say, these Mormon kids, they know. And they say, God never sinned. These little Mormon kids, they innocently and rightly and beautifully know that God never sinned. And I tell them, don't let the church take that away from you. Someday you will grow up and someone will explain something to you that sounds very strange about God that suggests God was once perhaps a sinner. Don't buy into that, little children. Don't ever give up the belief that God never sinned. Mormon adults, I plead with you, do not let the church take that away from them. Don't let your children graduate from childhood to the belief that God was once perhaps a sinner. No, 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 no. Jesus said, whoever causes one of these little ones to believe, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him 
to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. A few, conver- a few uh, months ago, I had a conversation at Temple Square with a Mormon lady about the nature of God. And at the end, she asked me, well, why does this, all this matter? Why does it matter if God sinned? I mean, why does it matter if we have the first God? I answered that the greatest purpose that we have in life is to know and to love and to enjoy and to praise and to worship God. And she answered, it's not like God wants you to worship him forever. And I'll end my talk by answering her objection with a song and a scripture. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. My God doesn't sing that song! I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. When we've been there 10,000 million, billion, billion, billion years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's grace than when we first begun. The last thing I'll leave you with is Revelation 4. And I've been holding off on this because it's got the most beautiful verse in it ultimately relevant to this issue. I should have quoted it before, but I haven't yet. I want to put it in context. And I want it to also serve as a response to this girl who said, not like we're going to worship God forever. Okay. Revelation 4. And this, after this, I looked. And behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Beautiful jewels. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the thrones came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a a sea of glass, like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, were four living creatures, full of eyes and front and behind. And the first living creature was like a lion. The the second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature um, like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, pause, What kind of God creates creatures to do this? What kind of God are we dealing with here? And the four living creatures, each of them, with six wings and full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I love you guys. Grace and peace.